government that we'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. The City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Well, today we are very privileged to host uh, Harjeet, Dr. Harjeet Gruwal in our department series. Uh, Harjeet teaches courses in Asian religion, Sikhism in the Department of Classics and Religion at the University of Calgary. He completed his dissertation entitled Janam Saki, Retracing Networks of Interpretation at the University of Michigan Department of Asian Languages and Cultures in 2017. In this dissertation, Harjeet examines central early Sikh literature by considering the intellectual systems, literary paradigms and philosophical outlooks, outlooks which pervade early Janam Saki manuscripts. Harjeet is currently working on turning this into a book length study of the Janam Saki literature and a co-written book on hip hop, Khalistani rap and social justice. Uh, just so many great ideas going on there. And on a personal note, I would add that Harjeet is, his door is always open and he's just a great resource uh, on uh, Sikh studies. Uh, his presentation today is entitled The Deceitful Friend and Guru Nanak, Reconsidering Redemption in the Sikh tradition. Uh, following his presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, I think via audio or chat. And while our expressions are somewhat limited, join me in some virtual way in welcoming Harjeet as our speaker today. <laughs> I guess ho hopefully that'll be the most awkward part of um, yeah. this afternoon. <laughs> so, so virtual clapping. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Craig, and thank you to the faculty, uh, colleagues, students, and community members who are uh, joining us here virtually today um, to discuss uh, connections between Sikh literature and Sikh thought. Uh, I'm especially grateful to uh, Leslie Bolton and Enrica Cassis uh, for thinking of me when planning this year's uh, fall lecture series uh, and allowing me a chance to kind of share my ideas and um, entertain and engage uh, and dialogue with everyone here. Uh, so yeah. The title of my talk again is The Deceitful Friend and Guru Nanak, uh, Reconsidering Redemption in the Sikh Tradition. Uh, the Deceitful Friend or Sajjan Tag, or Sajjan Tag uh, is a popular Sakhi narrative that occurs shortly before Guru Nanak and his companion Mardana depart for their mo first uh, protracted teaching sojourn. I will be discussing this Sakhi using uh, a B6 uh, Janam Saki manuscript. So it's a specific um, manuscript uh, which is housed in uh, the British Library currently. B6 is the shelf mark. Um, it has a bunch of different names through um, several uh, centuries of engagement. So I'm not gonna refer to it as anything other than the B6 um, manuscript. The uh, actual Saki itself uh, occurs across several folios, um, 37 recto to 39 verso. The Sajjan Tag Sakhi recounts the theft and murder of unsuspecting travelers by Sajjan Tag, uh, an educated resident of Mahdumpur or Tulamba. Tulamba is its older name uh, in modern day Pakistan. Nanak and his companion Mardana chance upon Sajjan's domicile on their way from Sultanpur to Delhi. Like other travelers, uh, this is kind of a roundabout way to Delhi as well. Um, it's actually west of uh, Lahore, a few hundred kilometers. If you try to map out the distance from uh, Makhdumpur to Delhi, it's going to be around 500 plus um, in the most straightforward way. So it's a roundabout way to Delhi. Um, but there you have it. That's where they're heading. Uh, like other travelers, Nanak and Mardana think of uh, the domicile of the Sheikh as a safe place to stay for the night. They decide to enter Sajjan Tug's residence with the attempt to spend a night there. Nanak has a dialogue with Sajjan Tug, which prompts him to beg forgiveness for his past deeds. Nanak instructs him that forgiveness is possible only by forsaking his lifestyle and giving away his ill-gotten wealth. Nanak spends a few months with Sajjan Tug teaching him. And upon departing, Nanak tells Sajjan Tug to create a dharmshala or place of gathering um, where people can learn from uh, the sheikh. So the space where, where travelers were stripped of their belongings and and their lives is transformed um, by this encounter with Nanak into a reinvigorated space for learning. Uh, so I'm going to use this Saki um, allegorically uh, to prompt us to consider some questions about possible ways towards deracializing and uh, decolonizing university 
as a learning commons. And um, some of its problematic connections with, uh, you know, uh, discourses on racialization and coloniality that have been uh, the kind of site of recent protests and things like that across um, different parts of the world. So Sajin Tug raises uh, interconnected uh, questions in this regard. For instance, how can the framework through which post-colonial post six subjectivity uh, get, get referenced, disseminated and interpolated through modern discursive categories and analytic strategies uh, within world historical uh, religions discourse be disrupted? Although this frame seems relatively benign, positivistic and even empowering, when examined solely from the circulation within uh, university space, uh, I suggest uh, if you look at it from a more holistic um, approach and look at the impacts on communities, uh, I suggest that uh, this also produces a form of oppositionality predicated upon uh, repetitive productions of religious identity, uh, six being one of those uh, identities uh, that have proven to be subjected uh, to violence uh, and trauma. So this uh, needs to be recognized, this harm is, and it needs to be recognized that this harm is not limited um, to six, but to all those who participate in the spheres which are producing these types of identities uh, and maintaining their relevancy. So the second question uh, is, uh, can the Sikh literature uh, within the Janam Saki tradition and the narratological structure, uh, we can kind of uh, bring out therein, uh, can that be used uh, to discuss uh, some of the general problematics within human, humanities and social science discourses themselves. So rather than these stories being a specific instance or something that pertains only to sick lived experience, uh, is there a way to generalize these to general humanities questions um, and social science questions? Uh, so to put it uh, in a different way, uh, can problematizations of foundational thinking central to the early sick uh, form of literary intellection become relevant to current questions about decolonization and racialization through their narratological response to oppositional thinking. These questions are part of a larger analysis I'm conducting in my monograph draft. Uh, so I'm, I'm just kind of putting these here as flags to let you guys know what I'm thinking about and how these are informing my kind of analysis of uh, the Saki uh, as well. So um, having said that, uh, I want to kind of make sure that you know, to avoid confusion uh, about my own approach. Uh, I'm not here in trying to attempt any kind of historicist uh, methodology. I'm not pursuing that in my analysis right now. I'm also not opposed or antagonistic to those approaches. Uh, I see relevancy in them, but um, I'm currently not interested in that because I wanna talk about how these um, genomsakis can be generalized to human phenomena. So my interest is um, in attempting to kind of bring to surface um, some of what Stephen uh, G. Ray Jr., the president of Chicago Theological Seminary, uh, mentioned in a recent AAR webinar on anti-racism teaching, um, where he discussed the other humanizing effects of scholarship and pedagogy within today's university. Uh, other humanization, uh, he's mentioned as an ideational framework that refuses to generalize colonial and racialized lived experience. It insists that these experiences and problematics connected to them are self-referential. So they only pertain to those particular lives and cultures, worldviews that are affected by them. Um, the general questions must remain general questions. Um, this is obviously a way to also hate, uh, hate hide uh, <laughs> racialization. Um, so race terminology assists me in articulating my concerns about the debate regarding how to place the genom Saki within anglophonic consciousness. Um, by determining its authentic, quote unquote, uh, genre. So one's ability or inability to do this speaks to a desire for placing the genom Saki within a self-referential sick space so that the subject of genom Sakis are specific and predetermined uh, through an imaginary sick subjectivity. Uh, this subjectivity is a colonial subjectivity. So as I'm speaking specifically about uh, a certain type of subjectivity, I'm not saying that there is no subjectivity possible within the Sikh tradition. Um, Sikh subjectivity um, has a diversity and should be spoken about and engaged in diverse um, ways and should be brought into the present spaces. Um, so this logic is disingenuous uh, when it is recognized that the post-colonial historicist debate about um, Janam Saki's 
is central to producing the very subjectivity to which sick thought uh, should be delimited. So in order to avoid other humanizing, I pursue a philological approach that is regaining intellectual traction. I'm here referring to a more ameliatory aspect of philology as a study of the whole matter of the text, um, something which Said, uh, Edward Said referred to um, in kind of his uh, seminal work, Orientalism, and something that's been um, starting to be re-engaged uh, in, in scholarship um, and discussed uh, in relation to Indology and other forms of knowledge. So a deep engagement and pursuance of the whole matter of the Janam Sahi manuscripts helps perform what Gadamer referred to as a philosophical hermeneutics. Doing this in colonial spaces uh, may bring other humanized experience back within uh, the shared engagement and critical thought in the humanities and social sciences. So while talking about Gadamer, I'm also kind of signaling some resistance to his um, discussion about the limits or the limitations or delimiting um, the horizons of knowledge as well. So again, I'm trying to generalize that kind of philosophical hermeneutic idea at the same time. The other benefits of this approach are the rig rigorous analysis of text without antagonistic aspects of the reactionary subjectivities associated with post-coloniality and its ability to incorporate historiographical developments within the ambient of its analysis. Skepticism Toward, towards the impacts of colonial and post-colonial approaches is necessary uh, to bring sick intellectual um, engagements into the general uh, sphere of human, humanistic problematics. So in relation to the sick tradition, I suggest uh, this means considering strategies to actuate networks of sick intellection through textualities like the Janam Saki and their relationship with the Shri Guru Granth Sahib. I will argue that the Sikh tradition developed a testimonial literature, uh, a literary genre, which uses an allegorical phenomenology to enhance the transformative effect of Gursik practices. Moreover, these practices have epiphenomenal implications in that they address uh, divisiveness, societal instability, and violence connected to subjectification. Saki narratives testify to the epiphenomenal transformation of cognitive and physical action through a practice of nominal recitative reading or nam simran. The epiphenomenal transformation suggested in the Sajjan Tagsaki addresses the human problems of difference or differentiation, inequity and hierarchical privilege by allegorically indexing a redemptive non-oppositional ideality. It allows practitioners to reclaim a way of being that is not founded in oppositional identities. The act of reclamation is transformative and redefines being human as harmonized expression of oneness in many. So the word for that in Punjabi would be ek anik. By rethinking Sikh neurological methods, we can engage in humanistic questions and reframe traditions of intellection outside of regionally determined horizons of limitation. So by doing that, uh, I think that goes back to what um, Stephen G. Ray was talking about in terms of how to bring the other humanized back into the general questions of humanities. So before we jump into the Saki uh, itself, I want to take a few minutes to kind of discuss uh, some of what my research uh, has looked at in terms of the textuality and the narratology of the Janam Saki form itself. So, the Janusakis are a distinct genre of Sikh literature found in manuscript compendiums containing anecdotal, analogic, and dialogic narratives about the first Sikh guru, Nanak Bedi. Each individual anecdote taken separately is referred to as a Saki. Based on the manuscript archive by the mid 19th century, after the lineage of embodied Sikh gurus had ended, the Janam Saki literature was popular and there existed different individual compendiums um, some of which resemble one another more or less than the others do. All Janam Sakis recount uh, the important developmental phases of Guru Nanak's life. Most anecdotes involve Nanak's interpersonal relationships and interlocutions uh, he had with individuals uh, where invariably an element of wonderment or cognitive dissonance is experienced. Uh, this dissonance prompts a series of questions to be asked to Nanak and therein um, some of what I will refer to as kind of the allegorical 
um, presencing, um, the phenomenology of allegory kind of comes into shape. So Nanak's adult life is marked uh, by a period of working as a granary at Sultanpur, a regional capital of the Lopi dynasty. This was followed by a series of four or five separate journeys, which take Nanak across many parts of South and Central Asia. Uh, two early six, uh, Bhai Bala Sandhu and Bhai Mardana, act as literary foils to Nanak as they meet and interact with a host of characters. In the latter part, Guru Nanak creates a new settlement named Kartarpur, or the Creator's City. Through their focus on Nanak's life, Janam Sakhi manuscripts share narrative elements with popular Sufi Malfuzat and Bhakti Vartas. Uh, although this should not be taken to mean they perform, the sim perform similar functions, nor should we assume that they had uh, a singular function across all of these traditions. Uh, so that's a little bit problematic to claim. I think a uh, deeper comparative analysis um, and deeper engagement in each of these traditions is necessary. Um, prior to making any claims like that. So I, I'm not uh, doing that by suggesting uh, the similarity in the forms here. The dissemination of Janam Sakis during the colonial period begins with their translation into English as life stories uh, bracket about Guru Nanak in the 1870s. So Janam Saki itself uh, doesn't really say anything. Guru Nanak is added in there as a bracket. Okay, so it's part of the translation process into English. Uh, this translation grounds the mid 20th century historiographic debate about which genre biography or hagiography um, is most appropriate or most amenable to the Janam Saki and making it available for historical analysis. The writings of people like Ernest Trump and Max Arthur McAuliffe wherein the translation of Janam Saki is repeated are important in solidifying conceptualizations of the Janam Saki within colonial space. Uh, through what David Chidester recognizes as a two-way traffic of colonial knowledge production mechanisms. In Empire of Religion, Imperialism and Comparative Religion, Chidester recognizes how raw data moves from native informants through a network of colonized native ecumenical classes to eventually be used comparatively and theoretically at colonial centers like London and Paris. Uh, he also shows that these theories circled back to impact and modulate native systems of knowledge as well. So they were not simply moving out of the colonies, they were circling back and affecting native systems of knowledge themselves and altering the way that native systems of knowledge looked or appeared to colonizers. So in the context of imperialism, uh, religious literature helped to define uh, governmental subjects, but also rerouted subjectivity to make it available for governmentalization. The interconnections between empire, language and information have been noted by many historians of South Asia as well, such as Chris Bailey. Um, there's a whole host of people who work generally in South Asia. Um, Chris Bailey is one of the earlier people who is working in this regard, um, specifically within the uh, regional context of Punjab. Um, scholars like Kurjot Oberoi, Richard Fox, Freena Mir, uh, to name a few, have kind of worked on this aspect as well. More, more recently, um, scholars like Bilbinder Bogel have looked at aspects of decolonization also. So I've noted how this circularity can be seen in the responses to Janam Saki's translations um, by colonial Punjabi writers like Professor Gurmukh Singh, Karam Singh historian, and Faibir Singh. All three were involved in discussions on how to adapt Janam Saki's both structurally and in terms of content in order to engage and deal with imperial realities. You can kind of see also um, the effect that um, the colonial space had on these thinkers as well. They are often um, quite um, cognizant of the fact that what a colonizer administrator is saying um, is simply correct. So there's no questioning uh, in terms of the type of dialogues that are happening between these interlocutors. Uh, so the post-colonial scholarly studies of Janam Saki, so this is moving forward into post-1947 um, intellectual space. Uh, the studies of Janam Saki's here by Harban Singh, Gurpal Singh, and Piyar Singh uh, can be read as struggling to adapt Janam Saki's uh, within a nationalist context or a looming national context in the case of um, some of them, defined largely by communal violence. The impact of colonial knowledge production and increasing urgency dis to disseminate Janam Saki can be seen in the works of W.H. McLeod and Sergei Hans who both recognized that the number of Janam Sakis increased after British annexation of the Lahore Kingdom. Interestingly, Hans notes that by 1870s, 
the size of genome sake compendiums in their print form and the number of sakis um, within each of these compendiums was rapidly increasing. Uh, and this was kind of shifting uh, the narrative form as well. There was a decreasing consistency uh, within the narrative form of the whole uh, compendium of a genome sake. So no dependent uh, study of present printed genome sakis um, has been produced up to this point. So I'm just kind of marking that as something important to recognize and something that needs more uh, serious scholarship going forward. Uh, I suggest that to move uh, beyond these definitions, uh, the definitions of hagiography and uh, bi biography and kind of the questions that are involved there requires the recognition of debates uh, dealing with decolonization and deracialization. So un until we recognize these issues, uh, it's, it's kind of, I think, something emblematic in six studies anyways has been a struggle um, with, with how to look at text and textuality and the manuscript archive. Um, so recognizing um, the need for decolonization and deracialization is important um, within the global diasporic context of today's Sikh community and the kind of productions of uh, intellectual knowledge that occur in the various diasporic spaces as well. So uh, in my estimation, approaching the Janam Sakis with these thoughts in mind should begin by examining Janam Saki narratology, its literariness and the parameters of its use in Sikh Sangits or gathering spaces. These three aspects allow a more nuanced and critical way to look at the developments and changes to what remain a central Sikh literary genre. Interestingly, the narratology of the Janamsaki is connected to the textuality of the Shri Guru Granth Sahib, a living textually embodied guru for Sikhs that contains the writings of many Sikh gurus, fakirs, and bhagats. In most anecdotes, of, the, of most Saki anecdotes, um, as Nanak engages an interlocutor, he begins to sing his poetic compositions or shabbats with Mardana and Bala accompanying him as instruments of witness or Saki. Thus the Janam Saki acts as a literary graft to expand uh, or expanding upon the transformative aspects of the non-oppositional op oppositional oneness, um, which is found and grounded in the Shri Guru Granth Sahib itself. Um, creating Sakis as a new narratological form, a living witness, uh, a living witness of life, um, acts as a way to extend um, the textual form and expand upon the ideas uh, within the Guru Granth Sahib. And I think represents a form of Sikh intellect in a way Sikh thought literarily, if you will. As mainly performative texts, Janam Sakis regularly intertwine their narrative prose with Shabbats from Shri Guru Granth Sahib. The Janam Saki is an extension of the transformation to the truth in oneness of being that is central to the epistemic structure of the Shri Guru Granth Sahib, just as I mentioned. Uh, through its performance, the Janam Saki creates a space within any Sangha uh, gathering where individuals can then participate in the living affect of the Shabd composition. Traditionally, sakis were performed as kata, following the sequential practice of reciting prescribed compositions um, in nitne from the Shri Guru Granth Sahib itself, uh, and then moving to the Sangat gathering space to listen to singing of Shabbat in the form of kirtan. By the 18th century, the sequential practices I've just mentioned are found in doctrinal manuscripts called Ratnamas. The development of these codices coincides with the period where the number of Janam Saki manuscripts is increasing. Interestingly, the Ratnamas also appropriate the Saki paradigm by using phraseology like Sak Guru Granth Sahib when incorporating direct quotes into their codices. The Ratnamas also often end with Saki sections. So Saki narratives are also within uh, Ratnamas as well. So again, we see that type of grafting I'm trying to talk about um, texts um, being grafted onto other texts, uh, textuality moving into other textual spaces. So this shows that the popularity of the Janam Saki and their codification were occurring around the same period during the 18th century. So Gatha was a way of producing meaning from the Shri Guru Granth Sahib through narrativization rather than lecturing like I'm doing now. Uh, <laughs> I uh, conducted oral history interviews uh, with contemporary performers of Katha called Katha Vachiks in 2013. 
Uh, the Katavachiks consistently saw sakis as part of kata. They also referred to the importance of the affect of kata regularly using a metaphor about the ability of rain to penetrate parched barren land. The metaphor was about the impact of the successive use of compositions from the Sri Guru Granth Sahib in daily Sikh practices, their differing impacts on the practitioner and the importance of kata within that sequentiality. Nitnam was described as a deluge of water upon parched land, uh, which led to flooding, but largely left the land unaffected. Kirtan uh, was discussed as something that kind of lifted the person into the movement of the water itself and carried the person along with it uh, in the flood itself. Parts of the land uh, might get carried along with um, this movement, uh, but the deluge doesn't go beyond the upper surface of this uh, territory. Gata, on the other hand, is described as a slow enriching shower of rain where the land absorbs the water and is nourished by this absorption. So already in the way they're describing a theory of writing this, there's a metaphoricity uh, embedded in the way writing is approached. Uh, so while all aspects of routinized Sikh practice are significant here, Gata is singled out as the most impactful uh, and representative of a way to develop understanding that leads to the automaticity of the oneness of being. Uh, by that, I mean the ability to act through oneness without mindfulness, through regularization and habituation. This is important in opening out how thought was engaged with and expressed within the Sikh tradition. My interviews, uh, my interviewees, sorry, uh, discussed uh, how composing and performing Qatar required learning and critical application of knowledge through a systematic approach of textuality called Gatha di Parpati. So this is, uh, there, this is a system of um, doing Gatha, but also writing Gatha. Uh, there are five elements to consider when creating and performing a Gatha. Uh, first is the otanika, or the situatedness of the hymn. Uh, the Shabad Art is the second one. Uh, this is uh, also called the Shabad Bhav, or the meaning of individual words within a Shabad or composition from the Guru Granth Sahib the parman or references uh, supporting statements and assertions uh, as well as examples are the third element. Uh, fourthly, there's the drishtant, uh, similes, metaphors, and other literary figurative uses of language and the sumucha bhav or the comprehensive meaning um, that can be made by the other elements alongside uh, the Guru Granth Sahib. So together, these elements are meant to create an atmosphere, a mahal, uh, to lucidly expand upon Shabbat from the Shri Guru Granth Sahib and effectively convey the referen referentiality embedded within the Shabbat. So I'm thinking about Paul Rucker's work here, where I'm talking about thinking about how a text um, actually moves from its space into a human space. So the, it refers to humanity in some way. Um, I think there's something like that in the way Katavi Parpati is approached. So Katha Di Parpati is also um, not really mentioned in modern scholastic debates about uh, Janam Sakhi literature. Uh, and I suggest reincorporating um, discussions of it within uh, approaches to Sakhi's reopens a way to engage with the narratological and, ep and epistemic world um, wherein critical thinking uh, was happening in the Sikh tradition. Um, recognizing Katha Di Parpati also is a way to uh, resist that other humanizing element. So rather than ignoring um, and leaving out these aspects, um, to re-engage uh, these and think about how to apply them in a humanistic sphere uh, that extends beyond the Sikh tradition. I argue Katha Di Parpati is cent central to the narratological um, universe of creating Sikh textuality um, and is really relevant to the Janam Sakhi tradition specifically. Building on recent work uh, by Brenda Machowski uh, in a book titled Structures of Appearing, Allegory and the Work of Literature. Uh, I think you, uh, we can kind of engage uh, some of literary understandings of allegory um, and reflect on Katati Parpati uh, to show how Sikhs were talking about allegorical structures, uh, Sikh intellectuals, Sikh uh, exponents. The Sikh tradition used um, this type of writing to present something unpresentable. Uh, is often called a kat kata within the Shri Guru Granth Sahib. The gap between the thing presented in the word 
and its resemblance to that which cannot manifest in language, something that's outside of language, uh, perhaps in the world, creates a tensional structure that enables an appearance of the unmanifest in the word, phrase, image, etc. In this way, the unmanifest can pierce through different spaces and time. Uh, it can be present in any instant. Texts that use this allegorical structure, like the Janamsakis, are engaging in um, the routinized recitative speech that six do with Nam Simran um, and are putting that into a textual space. Um, they're listening to the recitative speech as it exists within themselves while pointing to the structure of language used to perceive this appearing, um, which is within the Shri Guru, Guru Granth Sahib itself. The structure is outside of subjective experience and the texts using it are artistic, open-ended expressions of the inexpressible. So again, that's the akatha aspect. The perception of appearing creates a circuit wherein the poet might embed a reference to the unmanifest that carries itself to the audience. So this, the words get carried to the audience who's hearing this or receiving it. Uh, the event of appearing, uh, the allegorical moment, if you will, uh, remains new and abides always in a present, an, an instant of appearance. Examining the Janamsaki structure by recognizing creation and performance within the parameters of allegorical appearancing uh, using the system of Gatadi Parpati allows me to look beyond individual Sakis to consider how the flow of this appearing may have been working towards the fruitioning, um, using uh, Saki narratives uh, and looking for the fruitioning of affect uh, in the audiences themselves. So again, uh, I'm thinking a way that the texts are referencing something outside of themselves. Uh, Within the Janam Saki structure itself, I enumerate several sequences rather than looking at individual Sakis themselves. I think this is more reflective of how the system um, worked towards the affect. Uh, firstly, um, there's a prophetic birth sequence uh, dealing with Runanik's birth. Uh, secondly, there's a Sultan for mortification sequence. Um, after that, uh, there's a discourse on sur religious identity. Fourthly, uh, you see traveling and eventually um, moving back to the A place, a new, a new city, Kratarpur, um, and that kind of signals the death sequence uh, in the Janamsaki compendiums taken as a larger whole. So that might help us think about the Sumucha Bhav, if you will. Okay. So in a single Janamsaki manuscript recension, these four narrative sequences contain variations that express an interpretive diversity and individuality. So those might be the general parameters, but there's um, there's ways to incorporate this diversely and individually within any manuscript itself. Um, and I think the manuscripts often were attempts to um, reinvigorate and expand again, as I was saying, um, that kind of living textuality. As instruments of witnessing, uh, therefore, the Janam Saki structure uh, uses different textures uh, to focus listeners on the embedded Shabbat. The Shabbat is the primary focus. Uh, Sakis imaginatively enhance or adapt historical incident, incidents and can incorporate mythic and legendary elements to provoke questions through wonderment. Uh, so provoking the question here is also important uh, in a kind of dialogic space that would be uh, what a gathering is. This recognition allows us to consider that Janam Saki texts were delimited, delimited delimited, sorry, by the extent of uh, their author's engagement with uh, the practice understanding of the Shri Guru Granth Sahib. Sakhi narratology seeks to create a phenomenal space within which the Shabdic abstractions are brought to appearance and illuminated. So rather than a horizon of limitations that is cultural or lingual or philosophical here, what I'm saying is there's an individual way to look at these structures of limitations. Um, and those might be reflected in the nature of the very text and the writing that we're seeing in any particular manuscript. So enough about the Janam Sakis in general, uh, what does all this have to do with the Sajjan Tag Saki uh, and a way to look at this as transformative um, engagement in space as well as spaces of knowledge production? I argue that an analytic awareness of Gatati Parpati helps us resist the effects of other humanization and resituate the Sikh tradition within generalizable human problems. 
such as in issues such, such as issues associated with identification. The Sakhi narrative uh, stretches between the sequences uh, that I had mentioned just now, the four sequences. Uh, we can kind of splinter those um, if we want to focus in on this particular Sakhi, uh, and new key moments emerge. So uh, within the B6 Janam Sakhi manuscript, uh, these moments that pertain to the Sajjan Tagsaki specifically would be Nanak's discourse with the creator, um, his emergence into uh, the Vein River, is what it's known as, uh, his uh, return to Sultanpur and subsequent departure thereafter, uh, Mardana's visiting an Opal Katri village, and from there the arrival uh, at Sajjan Tag's domicile, his house. So those are the kind of um, sequences that we can kind of pair in on and examine to get into what Sajjan Tag is, uh, the Saki is telling us. So by looking at the figurative aspects of Nam or names um, within this uh, helps bring about the kind of allegorical, or helps us discuss the allegorical becoming that is being wrought um, through this uh, sequence of events. So this figuration does not occur in a single story, but is initiated in the first Saki and it crystallizes uh, when Nanak uh, famously exhorts uh, Nakwe Hindu, Nakwe Musulman, or Nakwo Hindu, Nakwe Musulman, uh, depending on the manuscript, uh, one is neither Hindu nor is one Muslim. Nanak is brought into presence, uh, Hazar Hua, at the true court before an entity uh, called Parmesat. Uh, so that can be the Lord, uh, but it's also kind of playing with the idea of boundaries. So Par, um, is to be at the limit of something, um, and sar is to be at kind of a border within something. So within, within the limit, uh, the border exists as well. It could be translated uh, through a different route. Um, and that's where he comes, uh, this border, uh, this, lim this limited space uh, that is bordered in certain ways. So what is this place? It's an open question. Um, the place of this court is obscured by the narrative. Nanak enters a stream of water, disappears, and then is taken to the true court uh, by messengers of the court. But Mesar tells him, Nanak eo amrita, eo mera naam ka pyala hai, tu piyo. Tab Guru Nanak tasleem ki ti pyala pita, sahib mehrwan hoa, Nanak mein tere naal haan, mein tere taayi nihal kiya hai. Ar jo tera naon lewe ga, so sab mein nihal ki ta hain. So to translate that um, command by Parmesar, uh, Nanak, this is Amrit Nam. It is the cup of my name. You drink. Then Nanak ac acquiesces and drinks the cup. The Sahib became inclined to favor him. Nanak, I am at your side. Through you, I uplift. All those who take your nam are uplifted by me. Leave now and recite my name and have the people recite it. Remain unaltered by the world. Dwell in nam giving ablutions and mindful service. I have given you my name. Go and act upon it. And so from there, Guru Nanak um, leaves and he emerges to say that famous phrase, uh, so what's being discussed here is a what I, I refer to as a naumatic trope. So the, the idea of nam, the taking of names, um, is being used tropically um, and repetitively within the Sakis. Um, you see one version of it here, uh, where Nanak meets the creator. Again, we do not know uh, where Nanak is or how this dialogue is occurring. Uh, it's kind of a personification of this um, bounded, limited entity. Uh, I argue uh, that this trope uh, is used to kind of, imp kind of create an impact in the audience uh, to remind them of the importance of the use of this recollective gathering space um, in order to kind of produce a non-oppositional automaticity that is signified by the absence of division between conceptualization, naming, and acting. When Nanak recites a Shabbat during his encounter with Sajjan Tag, the worldview from the true court of the creator and the phenomenal worldview of Sheikh Sajjan Tag collide. So this is, that's kind of part of the structure of this allegory of appearancing of this, 
what ref, what uh, recur refers to as kind of the metaphorical dissonance that's created between two different things. So understanding names can begin with the Utanako implotment, Makdum uh, Por, which again, we're not told that's where he lives, but we know that historically um, that's, there's a, a place called Makdum Por, which uh, there's uh, religious sites that are associated with Sikh Tag and Gurunanak's visit there. So Makdumpur is an actual place uh, where Sajjan Tag lived. Uh, there's evidence going back to the 17th century uh, that, which is uh, during the life of the sixth Guru, Guru Hargovind, that Gur Sikh uh, acknowledged Makdumpur as the place where Guru Nanak had this conversation with Sajjan Tag. So at the same time, uh, outside of its historicity, uh, Makdumpur signifies a space of encounter with the Sangha. Um, the Otanaka here is opened up figuratively uh, through the Drishtant or the figurative language. Makdumpur is an Arabic term for one who serves. Now, it's also a title or honorific used within South Asian Sufi tariqas and signifies a place where Sunnah or the customs and practices that facilitate oneness are taught. The term Sheikh is also important now um, as an honorific uh, for a learned person who is uh, sanctioned to teach uh, sunnah. Thus, uh, the place and personage signifies servicing uh, or service to learning. And I think that's how it makes it relevant um, to what we're talking about in terms of university spaces. The Sajjan Tagsaki posits a different worldview from the one expressed by Nanak after his return from the true court. From the outset, the Saki directs attention to how Hindus and Muslims were treated by the learned Sheikh. So people with certain types of subjectivity and their treatment within this learned um, space by this learned individual. Guru Nanak leaves uh, the Opal Khatri village and travels uh, some distance to get to Sajjan Tag's domicile. Uh, once we're in this narrative space, we're told that um, he has Sajjan Tag has a Thakur Dwar or a place for Hindu worship and a Masjid uh, where Muslims go to pray within his precincts. Uh, Sajjan Tag distinguishes uh, when guests come in, whether they're Hindu and Muslim, uh, to determine which place they'll enter later in the night to perform their prayers. Uh, he treats each based on how he recognizes them. And he gives hospitality or taur to Hindus and attentive respect or tawajjo for Muslims. Uh, so with the narrative going, the story tells us that as night approaches, um, he directs these pilgrims or these vis visitors to go to the Takardwar or the Masjid and perform their prayers. Um, after that, he leads them to their rooms. Uh, when they fall asleep, he kills them, takes their clothing and valuables. And then in the morning, uh, after having committed this horrific act, um, the sheikh uh, dons his fakir's garb again, uh, picks up a rosary and awaits his next victims. So uh, that's all said in very kind of matter of fact, uh, unemotional terminology. <laughs> so different than what we would expect in today's kind of narrative forms. Uh, Nanik and Mardana enter the scene uh, here and Sajjan Tag uh, recognizes Nanik uh, not as a Hindu or a Muslim, but someone who is an attained status, who is of a attained status and a fakir who has attained fakiri through agentive action. It says fal kar ke fakir hua hai. So it's through fal, through his own agentive action, he's attained fakiri. Nanak is recognized by Sajjan as having worldly riches, but is simultaneously marked as a self-attained fakir. He attends to his guests while plotting to rob them. Uh, however, as night approaches uh, and the tug asks to take them to their room. Neither Mardana nor Nanak um, are directed to any specific place of religious worship. Um, neither do they um, have any interest in um, partaking in prayers uh, either. It's actually um, Sajjan being so immersed or so anxious to take stuff that Guru Nanak has um, that makes him skip over this part of his repertoire and wants to, he wants to simply move them to bed. So it's Nanak who insists on reciting a Shabbat uh, about the bonds of, of the self formed. He says he wants to um, recite a Shabbat, uh, ki bandaki ga. so um, something about the self formed and the bonds of the self formed, a Shabbat that pertains to that. Uh, in a similar way to the vain parvish, uh, the instance of this Shabbat recitation is seemingly lost to the experiential time. 
Uh, and we're told we're not told where or when it's recited uh, within the Saki's context itself. We can assume it's um, you know close to bedtime, <laughs> but we're not told specifically um, you know what that time is. And and that actually does matter in the sense of if this was a time to pray, uh, what prayer is happening, right? So it's not insignificant. So. Uh, hearing Anik recite the Shabbat, Sajjan Tag gains knowledge, he gains darshan, uh, daris or darshan, a vision, but also a vision of knowledge. So there's a simultaneity in different language expressions here, lingual expressions that's going on. Uh, he gains knowledge of his misdeeds and desires bakshish, bakshish that Nanak intercede on his behalf to remove any account of his negative actions, guna or pop, pop. Begging for Nanak's benevolent intercession, um, he says, Ji mere gunai fadal kar, ji bot paap kite hain. So I've done a lot of negative things. I've done a lot of sins. Um, you know, intercede, give me salvation. Nanak defers any intercession on behalf of Sajjan and simply states, uh, in the court of Khoda, uh, full account is taken. Um, full account or both accounts, negative and positive. Sajjan then requests Nanak to tell him some way to have recourse. He's like, what do I do now? So Nanak uh, instructs our in, uh, Sajjan to do three things. He tells him to speak the truth, uh, give away what he stole, and recite Guru Guru. Uh, so he's, Sajjan Tag is affected by this um, and actually wants to have Nanak stay and um, teach him a bit longer. Uh, and here we again have the establishment of the center of learning. So as, as Nanak is departing, uh, he tells Sajjan to create a Dharamshala. And we're also told um, that Sajjan Tag becomes a Nam Tarika Sikh. So someone who is practicing a way uh, related to Nam or naming. I argue Sajjan Tag is awakened here uh, by the Shabbat itself. Now, this is not, um, the focus here again is shifted um, a little bit towards the Shabbat rather than a focus, a singular focus on uh, Guru Nanak. Um, the other way to look at this would be to think that there's a simultaneity in the body of Guru Nanak and the Shabbat itself. Um, the writing of Guru Nanak's body and the writing of the Shri Guru Granth Sahib are inseparable. Uh, that'd be closer to a fully kind of Gursik kind of explanation of this. So um, it's the Shabbat and Nanak's expression of it then in some way um, that is what's having the effect here. And that's what's being highlighted. So in this Shabbat, I'll just give you the translation here. It says, uh, can the blackness of bronze be removed by polishing it, it's making it shiny? Mm -hmm. Washing it does not remove the impurities, even if it is washed hundreds of times. Sajjan, so it's kind of in the context here, the Sajjan is referring to Sajjan Tug, right? Um, otherwise it would just be referring to a general friend. So Sajjan, travel along with me to that place where we are called into account. Here, your lavishly decorated houses, mansions, and towers are useless ruins. Your beautiful possessions and clothing only lead you to pilgrimage at in-between places. Tearing and rendering apart living being to acquire things cannot be purity. Mortals will, mortals will forget themselves when seeing my straight tree-like form. Uh, its fruits serve no purpose, and its quality cannot be possessed. The blind person carries a heavy load, and the mountainous journey is long. I see with my eyes, but find not the way. How can I ascend and cross the mountain? Uh, it is better to serve all, it is better to serve, sorry, all else's cleverness. Nanak, reflect upon Nam, and you will be released through it. So you're released through Nam. Okay, so here um, it's the Shabbat that's the transformational vehicle. Um, and it's talking about a different uh, way of perceiving things, a different way of serving, a different way of knowing. Um, this is a victory of Nam in some way that's being discussed here. So Sajjan has to act alone. Um, he has to do his own fal. Uh, Guru Nanak tells him, Khud fal kat, uh, in a manner that accredits credit um, to the good deeds and maybe balances his accounts in that true court. So to conclude, um, the learned sheikh here is somewhat out of place in Maktoonpur. So um, if you think about that as a scholar, is somewhat out of place in the place of learning um, and quite literally uh, is, at least in the case of Sajjan Tug, a learned amiable thug uh, who exploits uh, the subjective sentiments of people by differentiating them uh, using two oppositional existentialities within the text on uh, the terms Hindu and Muslim, of course. 
Uh, I should note here that while I'm aware of scholarly debates about the pervasiveness of these categories um, in early modern South Asia, um, my use of them is based on their presence in the Sakhi itself and how they're located in the Shri Guru Granth Sahib at the same time, uh, where these are seen as problematic categories um, anyways. So uh, it's the recognition of these categories that opens the space to humanize the other humanization of Sikh thinking and experience. Hindu and Muslim here mark a constellation of insider outsider associations that are governmental, religious, cultural, and ethnic. In short, they parallel many binary distinctions that are central and have become problematic in contemporary multicultural secular societies like ours. Uh, it is the recognizability of self-assertions of identity by travelers who enter such intact domicile that makes them susceptible to abuses and theft. So the entrance of Nanak and Mardana into the space disturbs things and Mahdumpur uh, again kind of becomes a place of learning, but also a place where the question about knowledge, uh, the pursuit of knowledge, knowledge production, acquisition, and ethical practices um, that connect to language can be asked. So um, that's everything I have to say. So thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Harjeet. Uh, I, Courtney, are you uh, lining up the responses to chat? Do I understand that correctly? Yes, between Stephanie and myself, we are monitoring that. Okay. So if anyone has questions, they would either like to type them in or if you would like to unmute yourself and ask verbally your questions, there's a couple different ways to do it. We would love to open that up for you guys and would love to hear from you. Yes, I have two questions. Uh, I'll wait my turn. You are first, Rune. Okay. Where you go? Uh, <laughs> so the, the first question is, uh, does believing in oneness in many, ek anek, mean believing that all religions are different paths to the same God or can Sikhism stand out as an exclusive religious ideology distinct to the Sikh people and as a separate alternative to other religious paths. This is my first question. I have one more. Okay. And second one? Second one is, does decolonization entail absorption of Sikhism into the secular liberal Western worldview or does Sikhism in the post-colonial context return to its traditional roots as a conservative right-hand path religion? So could you repeat the second question again, please, Rune? Uh, does decolonization entail absorption of Sikhism into the secular liberal Western worldview, or does Sikhism in the post-colonial context return to its traditional roots as a conservative right-hand path religion? What do you mean by right-hand path? Uh, like right-hand path, left-hand path, right-hand path is concerned with uh, dharma and uh, like obedience to the law and conservative religious values opposed to liberal religious values in the secular liberal context. Okay. Um, do you, uh, Craig, do you want me to answer the questions as we go or should we um, compile a few and then I'll, I'll take out a bunch and answer them together? How would you like to proceed? Uh, I think typically we'd answer them as they come, but it okay. Do you, have a, do you have a preference, Arjit? No, I think that's great. Yeah, we can definitely do that. So um, Rune, I think, uh, so to answer um, your first question, actually, I, I'll answer both of these questions. I think they're kind of getting at the same thing. Um, and then if you have a follow-up, um, you know, uh, by all means, um, continue the conversation. So um, the question about whether um, just kind of believing in the oneness is um, something that's distinct or, or something that's shared, um, as well as um, the discussion about what the, aspects of decolonization in the secular um, kind of world sphere or world um, public space have to um, do with right-handed um, or traditional understandings of the Sikh uh, religion or the Sikh tradition. Uh, these are kind of things I'm, I'm actually uh, questioning, right? Uh, so I think what's being, what I'm trying to say is uh, that, that that is, precisely uh, what needs to be deracialized and decolonized. 
it's the thinking that these are self-referential questions. So that if, if, if you make any claim that is speaking about something sick, that it automatically has to refer to um, something that is subjectively sick, right? Um, and, and then it becomes a question of how pure or how authentic that thing is, right? Um, and, and within that kind of logic, there can be a spectrum of answers, right? Um, what, what I'm trying to say is, uh, is there a way uh, to look at how the tradition itself is trying to engage in what we would think of as broadly speaking, um, big problematic questions. So for instance, um, what does it mean to be human, right? Um, what does it mean to have an identity? Uh, what types of identities are productive? What types of identities are, are not productive? How can we come together in a more harmonious way? Um, so I think, I think what the um, portent of my uh, broader argument is that these sakis um, show uh, some level of engagement with those types of questions, but also a level of sophistication in thinking about um, how we should approach those questions themselves. So um, I think that that's a call to everybody, um, not just six, to kind of engage more deeply in, in those conversations. Um, what it does, I think, also do on the six side of it is give six a space uh, within which these questions can be questions that are uh, specific to the tradition and open out to uh, general ones as well. So um, in a way, it's trying to, uh, you know, kind of have something that is working along the lines of what might be considered a way to engage the bigger problematic, but do so um, along parameters that are defined within the thought of the Sikh Guru. So for instance, um, to make a, com a, a quick comparison, uh, if I was a, a phenomenologist, right? Um, I would say that I look at the work of these, 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 these um, philosophers or phenomenologists, and this is how I engage with those. And this is the kind of questions I'm interested in. Right? Um, if I'm a scholar of the Sikh tradition, um, it's difficult for me to say I am interested in, um, I don't know, like the thought of Guru Amar Das and his connection to Guru Nanak and how that's reflected in um, something like um, Bhai Jod Singh's uh, text, right? Even though I could be following the similar general questions that someone who's a phenomenologist might be, right? Um, so I'm trying to question that very exercise that we are undertaking in the way we're producing knowledge here and now um, in these spaces. Does that make sense? Thank you, Dr. Greval. That makes sense. Thank you very much for the answers. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, brought by Courtney from um, Jajot Oberoi. I can read it out for you if you'd like. Sure, please. Mm. Um, thank you for the stimulating paper. Um, your deconstruction of metropolitan categories of hagiography slash biography is welcome. Do you have any alternative category categories in mind? Would um, hermeneutic texts be an alternative? Right. Um, well, thank you, Arjot, for the question. Um, so I, I think one of the ways um, one of the ways to, to look at uh, what I'm saying here is that um, if we can invert uh, the coin, if you will, um, and, and speak about uh, the translationese of how hagiography and biography can meld so easily into um, the textual space of the Janam Sakis, uh, what I'm wondering um, more is that, are we able to think about um, the idea of Saki and how Saki is moving from, um, so Gurbin Saki Mool Nambaki is a line from the Guru Granth Sahib, right? Um, the recognition of Saki is coming from the Guru Granth Sahib and it's moving mm -hmm. into other textual spaces. So what I'm kind of asking and wondering is, is that can this, um, can this uh, genre, can we recognize this as a genre? that Saki was a genre of writing. And it, it signaled a form of thinking about um, what you're doing when you're practicing um, Sikh practices, that you're witnessing something. 
And after, after a certain level of attainment, um, a certain type of writing can happen, which is Saki. Uh, so um, for me, I think it's important to try to, uh, again, in, in the sense of also uh, decolonizing and deracializing, uh, is to ask about what else can be Saki in a way, right? Um, mm. and, and how can we engage in a comparative uh, hermeneutics that is looking at that aspect of it as well. So are there other places, um, other, other knowledge uh, systems where we can see uh, something similar happening? And I think there, there potentially are, um, and that can be a site of engagement as well. So it's kind of to shift um, the pole uh, a little bit over uh, and, and kind of ask about uh, the etymology of that and then the textuality. And then from there, try to do a comparative project. Does that answer your question, Arjun? So the short of it is uh, Saki, I think, is a, a sufficient uh, genre. <laughs> um, are there, <laughs> are there any, he says thank you, by the <laughs> way. Um, are there any other questions? You can feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly, or like I said, you can write it in the chat. Oh, uh, Cassis, Ms. Ms. Marika, please. I heard you. Thank you so much. That was interest. That was so interesting, and I really, really hope that the pandemic is over soon, so we can go back to discussing this in the library. Right. Um, I, I'm really struck by the parallels in some of what you're saying about the decolonization of how this literature is looked at, how things are looked at, and the, the categories. I mean, I, I see the same problems in my own work in Byzantine studies, it's a completely different field, but, but undoing the damage of the colonial narrative and how things are presented. And I'm, I, I'd actually like to know how you um, how you deal with pushback from sort of traditional scholarly approaches to this, which tend to be, you know, in an, a school that goes back to the British way of looking. I mean, we see this in Near Eastern archaeology all the time. We're still dealing with narratives from 19 or 1810. So how do you, how do you push back? How do you deal with that in, in the wider scholarly community? Um, so I think you know, um, I mean, there's some people here um, who are um, amongst my colleagues within six studies, so I mean, they have some experience and might want to join in um, about <laughs> how I how I deal with this. And some of them have seen me deal with this, but um, I think that uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, I, I think again, looking at these um, spaces and institutions we have, and these moments for dialogue and engagement uh, as ones that should be productive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's something that I take really seriously and I, I try to, um, uh, you know, kind of espouse that as much as I can. Uh, and I also recognize that I'm just giving one perspective, right? And it's, it's just a, you know, like my, my uh, I mean, I, you know, Harjot is uh, fortunately here with us, but I mean, Harjot and I had a conversation um, almost 20 years ago uh, where he kind of said to me, you know, you could spend your life uh, looking at Janam Sakis. And you know, here I am 17, 18 years later, um, <laughs> um, you know, and I, I, I honestly was reflecting on this, um, uh, you know, as I was, I was thinking about uh, the rewrite uh, here is that, you know, th there's just so much wealth here. And, and I think that that's one way that I uh, try to recognize some of this stuff is that there's, there's a wealth in all of these traditions and what's cool about the Sikh tradition is it, it is recognizing that. It is recognizing that there's a wealth in all these traditions. Mm -hmm. So then it's trying to think about how, how do we engage this wealth and talk to each other, right? So um, I think that trying to keep that in mind uh, is really important as well. And um, I, again, what I think is really interesting about um, when, you, when you start to delve into the tradition itself is that it really, it really is trying to do something um, earnest in the sense of, recognizing that um, in any, any moment in time, um, there exist uh, a whole assortment of divisions, right? And, and ways of um, opposing each other. The question is, how do you as an individual um, try to go beyond some of those boundaries, right? And so I, I think at some level, my studies sustain um, 
me through some of those things too. <laughs> because like uh, th there's a lot of proximity. And I think when I was choosing to, to study this as well, I think that's kind of what I saw it, it originally. I wanted to kind of get into um, some of that depth and, and kind of bring that out. And I, I think that's valid to say that, you know, um, you know, th there's important, I mean, I, I, I did it in my paper. I mean, there's, there's importance in recognizing that Makhdoompur is a historical place, um, that there's a history, thousand, uh, not thousands, but centuries year old history that is connecting Guru Nanak and Sajjan Tug's um, conversation, right? Um, there's other examples, uh, you know, scattered throughout Punjab. So there's, there's a history, there's a facticity to these things, right? But the interesting question is when they are brought into literature, into a literary space uh, within, within the Sikh tradition, um, especially prior to its um, colonization, right? And the changing or uh, rerouting of its production systems. Um, these production systems still exist, mind you, right? They're still there, right? That's why I was able to talk to people and learn about this, right? But it, it's kind of recognizing all these things and these fissures um, aren't just fissures between, um, you know, one tradition and the other, but they, um, you know, kind of permeate all traditions, right? And so um, I, I kind of try to bring that uh, into the conversation as much as possible when I'm uh, dealing with this. Uh, it, it can get difficult when you're dealing with modern moments that are um, a, a little bit more, uh, you know, you're dealing with uh, lived trauma, right? And so that can be a little bit different. I think it, it requires a different uh, form of uh, conversation and, and really creating an open space. Uh, I, think, uh, I think one of the things, as reflecting on the idea of learning um, and humanities uh, is I think really, really trying to adhere to that open space uh, and how to, how to think, think about how to create that open space for yourself as a thinker, but also for students who want to engage in this stuff. So I, I'm, that's kind of how I approach it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I see that there's a hand up from um, Herbans. You can feel free to um, unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, or write it out. Uh, Maybe Herbans might have some difficulties um, I'm muting himself. Maybe uh, is, is someone able to unmute him so that he can speak? Um, I think it's a new uh, Zoom might be a new thing. Okay. Um, I'm actually don't. I think that um, he is unmuted. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, there just might be a mic issue. Um, if you open the chat, you're also free to write it out. Um, I see that Dr. Ruparal also has a question. Um... Uh, yeah, maybe while he's getting this technical issue going, I'll, I'll ask a question. Thanks very much, Arjit. Really interesting talk. And, and you're tackling a couple of issues that um, I also have to worry about. So I'm kind of wondering how you deal with this. Um, and it seems to me that <clears throat> the kind of general strategy of wanting to um, move away from certain kinds of Western categories by reclaiming and redescribing um, Sikh categories and, and working from within that kind of um, uh, uniqueness and specificity outwards to a more general sort of context uh, could fall afoul to uh, a particular problem. The same kind of strategy is used in uh, in Christian theology, as well as in some forms of interreligious dialogue by uh, this term or this, this movement called uh, scriptural reasoning, which I'm sure you've heard about. And the, one of the problems with scriptural reasoning, and they're doing really very much the same kind of thing in some ways, they're really trying to, um, as it were, honor the specificity of their positions while at the same time uh, trying to say something more general. Um, the problem there is that the specificity of their reasoning is tied to particular metaphysical and epistemological uh, positions. 
which are much more difficult to translate into this modern uh, or, or in a more general context. Um, it feels like um, when they speak to a broader context, and it's interesting that they often don't, they only ever speak to uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jews themselves, right? So they, they get away uh, from the argument or the problem by limiting their scope. But it seems like what you want to do is something different. And if you do, then how is it that you are going to manage that translation of fairly axiomatic metaphysical and, ex and, and epistemological commitments? Um, those are where the rubber hits the road. So that's, that's the one big question. Right. The other one, um, a simpler question, I think, is um, <clears throat> in the, and I'm really glad to hear that you're, you've been developing this theory of kata. I think that it's, it's an incredibly important ritual in Indian religions generally, <clears throat> and it's not studied well enough. Um, but um, with kata, that um, it seemed to me, and maybe I'm wrong here, it, it sounded like the kind of um, allegorical or metaphorical sort of transformations you were looking at, you, you tended, I think, to focus that on a kind of poetic creation from the, uh, the, the person doing the kata or particular people, right? And I'm wondering how in that context could a eccentric or a completely weird interpretation or transformation be uh, managed and negotiated? Um, yeah, so like the question of how, how, would you, how would you know whether one of those transformations is just, you know, kooky um, and wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, what's, the, what's the theory of error there? So that's a simpler question, I think. Right. Um, so I guess um, I'll just start with the, I'll actually, if I answer the kata one, I might be able to broach into um, what you're saying with the, with the first one. Uh, so I think uh, <clears throat> there, it actually, so it's a little bit in my understanding, there is some openness to entertain uh, the possibility that people will have, um, you know, variant and you know, from, from certain perspectives, might seem kooky uh, interpretations. Um, and and there have been uh, examples of this um, from the beginning of the Sikh tradition. Uh, so I think one of the one of the things to look at is some of the strategies that were used um, in terms of the internal divisions, uh, right? Um, so, so with Katha and the system itself. Um, you know, yeah, so if, if you can kind of master the system, if you will, um, it doesn't matter what you've attained, um, right? It's just your ability to uh, master the mechanism of it, right? And so there can be a kind of, uh, I mean, it almost kind of just goes back to that, that metaphor of, um, you know, the bronze that is, is being talked about, right? So just by rubbing the bronze and making it shiny again, um, it might be attractive, but you're not talking about the elemental aspects of bronze. You're not talking about the ability of bronze to tarnish over time, right? And, how that's a part of bronze-ness, right? So um, in, in recognizing that there can be a bunch of different ways to look at this, and some may, may be, um, you know, less, you know, effective, right? Uh, the, the, I think that what the tradition has kind of, you know, in, in looking at the divisions that it's had, um, had recourse to is that there is the ability of whether or not you can maintain a space that is, and this goes back to the open space question, a space that's truly open, right? Um, so, uh, and that, you know, I, I think there's there's a struggle in inside the Sikh tradition um, to retain this, and there's an awareness of this, that uh, the Sangat, uh, a Sikh Sangat is a Sangat for everybody, right? Um, it's codified in Sikh space, um, it's talked about in, this, in the religious language, um, people try to adhere to that in their lives and their actions. Um, but when people come together, uh, is the question is, can you maintain that openness, right? I, mean, I, I think that's what helps us broach it into the learning question itself, is that there's a bunch of places where maintaining this openness is relevant, right? Um, so I think um, one of the ways to answer that question is um, there's, a, there's an aspect of the system itself that's saying, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of upon the person who's um, creating these texts and performing these texts um, there's an there's kind of an ethics of this right that you should try to maintain this open space right um and again i think that that 
um, reflects on an open question in the community. Um, are we uh, retaining an open space? People might ask this in the tradition, right? And, and people try to debate that and, and dialogue that in modern contexts, especially in diaspora contexts, right? Where um, people may not be as familiar with the fact that they can just walk into um, many of these spaces and um, you know, try to engage um, people there, right? So I think there's a mechanism within that where you know, if something is overly kooky, um, I think it would take a lot of effort uh, to convince everybody um, to, and retain that open space. Um, so if, if you think of the importance of a di uh, dialogic democratic public sphere, uh, we can look south to our neighbors and sorry, uh, I know Harban Slal is actually in America right now, is probably worried about the American elections, but um, you know, the, the inability of a leader to maintain cohesiveness in an open space, if nothing else, right? I think it, it reflects there as well. So um, I think kookiness is kookiness, right? And people um, by and large, when they participate in it, um, they may even recognize it, right? So um, I, I think it goes back to that. There's that openness of the space. And, and that kind of, I think, helps me um, with, with the theological question you're asking and the kind of specific metaphysical positions um, that within any, they, these exist within any religious tradition, right? There's, you know, every religious tradition is very, very complicated, right? Um, so I, I think w one of the things that needs to be recognized here and um, marked is that, you know, um, there's some good work that religious studies departments can do in universities um, for one thing, right? Uh, in, in kind of creating dialogic spaces of exchange, right? Uh, where, and, and we don't have enough of those, I think, in secular society. So I think, I think uh, you know, especially since uh, big moments like 9-11, uh, you're seeing uh, religion in the public space, but you're not seeing public spaces that let you learn about religion. So I, I hear that a lot from my students as well, that, you know, um, there's not a lot of space where we can talk about religious questions, right? Um, not just religious knowledge, but like how religious enters into the public space. Um, so, so people wanting to bring, um, you know, theological um, expressions, specific metaphysical ones, into that public space, um, I, I think there's a certain kind of openness we have to have to decolonizing that as well. So kind of recognize that religious space and public space aren't separate, right? The secular um, hasn't been separate. And this is kind of where post-secular critique comes in. Um, these aren't separate spaces, but there's a question of why is um, th the state, uh, the secular state trying to police uh, religious religious um, questions out of the public space, right? So um, I think the more knowledgeable people are about different religious traditions, the more those conversations can enter into the public sphere in a rational dialogic way. And again, that pushes it into making you responsible in the kind of claims you're making, right? So, I mean, I could have been saying something wacky and kooky right now, right? So I could just be relying on the fact that no one knows anything about what I'm talking about, right? Um, but, but I think inviting people in who are knowledgeable and more knowledgeable than I am, right, um, I think is a way to also balance some of that as well. Does that, does that make sense? Like, so I, I don't want to be an authority in any of this. I don't think that um, in, in those other circles, like Christian theological circles, um, there should be that kind of um, aspect of de-authoritarianizing kind of, you know, the conversation. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, thanks. I, I mean, uh, perhaps we'll continue Sweet. a conversation with you yeah. later. But it's a little... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Are there other questions? Um, yes, we have, quite a few, uh, <laughs> we have quite a few in the chat. Um, it seems like there was one that was connected, just posted now. Um, then maybe we can circle back up to the two others. Sure. Um, so Durga Kale writes, um, thank you, Dr. Grewal and Dr. Rubrell's question to open up a portal for mine. Um, one, I wonder about, uh, ooh, I just apologize in advance for these pronunciations. Um, I wonder about Tristanta and Katha's dialogical mediums within the Sangat or sometimes for a wider public. And does Guru uh, Nanak's hagiography essentially form a blueprint as such for this type of dialogical discourse? And uh, two, a follow-up to that will be the accessibility of narratives within um, Janam Saki through these mediums. Great, uh, that's great. Uh, thank you uh, for those questions, Dorga. I really appreciate that. So um, yeah, I think, you know, at some level uh, we are kind of looking at um, 
these Janam Saki texts as a blueprint in a way for um, the types of discourses that could, could happen in a Sangha, right? This isn't to say that they, they do happen or they must happen, right? Um, but, and at the same time, I think um, tying into Tinu's question, I, I think what's interesting about the um, literary space uh, as an ethical space um, is that it reflects or refracts um, some of the possibilities that are actually happening in real time, right? Um, so in the sense of, you know, if, if there's this blueprint there and it's not reflecting um, the real real time engagement, um, I, I think going back to what I was saying with Tino is that there, there is some recognition of that. I mean, it's a question of whether people can strive to open that out, right? Um, within diasporic spaces, uh, there's a lot of challenges. This kind of goes to your second question. Um, it's a question of accessibility, right? So um, this is where I think, you know, kind of being able to speak about these different types of knowledge um, in, in kind of a public conversation, if you will, um, helps bring in some of that blueprint um, in terms of what's happening in any Sangat, if you will, but also um, thinking about the Sangat as a commons, a public sphere itself, right? So then not trying to make it self-referential on um, something that Sikhs are doing, but um, is the public sphere a way to think about Sangat, right? And, and how can those two be in conversation with each other? And then, I think Tinu, um, you know, having the um, the trespass in translation, if you will, right, um, bringing bringing these things together um, when there's a desire to keep them separate, right? Um, I think that can kind of enrich the way we think about these things as well, and and dislocate them from their particularities um, in any in any one specific religious tradition. So, uh, and I think recognizing the figurative aspects of the language and the literariness in these things. Um, and being able to bring that out through translation and commentary, um, and then through coursework and other things like that kind of helps um, the university be that space, um, that kind of vital space where these things are happening, right? And I think that, again, if nothing else uh, is reflected in the Sakis again, is that when you leave those spaces, um, there's, a, there's kind of a question about what you're doing with the knowledge you're departing with. And that might um, be important in kind of thinking about what are our students leaving um, with as they go into their, um, you know, other roles in society and things like that. So does, it, does that answer your question, Dorka? So yes, thank you. Um, I'm just going to circle back. Um, Harbans did write his question. Oh, great. great. So um, he apologized for uh, not being able to unmute, but no says, I found it as a very good presentation and interpreting of a story from Janan Psaki. It is uh, the first time I heard it said that Sajan Thug was the first one who recognized both Miri and Piri in uh, Guru Yanak. Was there more or was it just a comment? Um, I suppose it was just a comment, uh, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, actually, I think um, Harbans, that's interesting to think about. I, mean, I, I um, acknowledge what you're saying here in the sense that, um, so the idea of Miri Piri is the idea that, um, you know, there's, there's uh, a co-location of spiritual and worldly matters and that people are, you know, we're always engaging in these things, whether we recognize it or not. Um, and there's a question about whether we can harmonize with the singularity of both of those things um, in anything we're doing, right? Um, so Miri Piri uh, is, is being talked about here, I think in an interesting way, because uh, you know, the obligations of Sajjan Tag uh, are being questioned, whereas um, the, what the Shabad and uh, Guru Nanak are doing in context of that are Kind of working towards changing the ability of him and his recognition in regards to what he's doing right and once that change happens um, there can be something uh, in terms of a conversation and learning going on so i think th that's i mean i, I think any, any, all of us who teach um you know you, you might see that in the teaching um you know pedagogical method as well right there's like i was in a pedagogy workshop once where uh one of those 
um, senior scholars are saying what they what they try to do is um, try to make the students um, e recognize that each student has something that needs to be challenged um, in order for them to be able to uh, engage with the material in the course itself. So con just constructing their course in that way, but also having um, that acknowledged in the way that the assignments and the conversations are happening as well. So again, I think there's there's something here in terms of um, that learning process as well as being talked about, which which again does speak to that harmonizing of worldly and spirituality and bringing it into kind of a single space rather than uh, you know kind of the private space of religion uh, versus the public space of kind of uh, dialogue about material, um, economic, political, other types of things. So, thanks, Ravans. Um, and the last question we've got so far is from Wendy. Um, she writes, uh, thank you, Harjit. Uh, in East Asian discourse, there is discussion of the distinction between pluralism as assembled varieties that remain sterilized, separated, and pluralism as diversity that recognizes reflexive um, criticism as internal to every category. For example, if I use the word Zuan, instead of biography, I can only converse with people in Chinese literature. If I talk about the reflexive critical capacity, uh, capacities for hagiography, then I have more conversation partners. Reflexive criticism, like pointing out one sect calling out the sectarian motives of others, turns problematic, of course, when used from a etic perspective. Yet the pivoting of emic and etic, Hermi um, pardon me, Hermeneutics is very productive, diversity enhancing discourse practice. Do you see this mutually reflexive pivoting as valuable? I do, yeah, I think so. I, I had made a point um, in, in part of the talk to say that it's, it's good to be skeptical about both colonial and post-colonial, um, like post-colonial critiques of colonialism, right? And uh, I think your question, Wendy, kind of speaks to that in the sense of I think that's some of the good work that post-colonial um, scholarship has done uh, in the sense that uh, it recognizes in, in the politics of post-colonial discourse is that there is no possibility for an apolitical stance. So the very conceptuality that is inherent in any language um, is political. So simply saying, um, you know, to make a claim that hagiography is uh, more dialogic, more discursive, it's true for now, right? But what I would say is that there needs to be more work done um, by people who want to uh, engage from that other side of the coin um, so that um, people who are looking at it from the hagiographic perspective can be in conversation with the terminologies that are within their respective zones. So it's kind of like a way of thinking about, um, you know, people say global, right? <laughs> um, that, that this global and local um, can be together, but they don't have to be together just in one lingual space, um, that people can recognize um, a multiplicity of um, conceptual engagements and the overlaps that occur uh, with them, but also maintain the distinctions. Just like you could say like, well, I don't know, why, why, why are you um, getting upset about biography and hagiography? They're the same thing, they're just stories about people. Like what's wrong with you, man? Right? <laughs> uh, you could, you could, <laughs> right? Like you could condense the terms um, on, on what they're, um, you know, mutually referring to, right? But but then you you leave something out, right? And that's kind of what I'm saying um, that's happening through translation as well, right? Um, we don't often recognize that um, because people who are more familiar, uh, scholars who are more familiar with the other language, the other lingual worlds, um, need to say that. Right? I think there's there's something that we you need to recognize that you know there's there's some combination of hagiography and biography going on yes uh, and then there's something else going on too and I think what's really cool is once you recognize um, some of the multiplicity in these things um, you know it, it's it's more enriching in terms of the type of scholarship you can do as well and hopefully that produces other people who you know through the various um, you know languages people are going to use uh, enrich. Um, those lingual worlds in different ways as well and, and bring them together and make them contact uh, each other in, in a different way, right? So I, I think that that's, you know, it, I probably lean to more um, the pluralism where, um, you know, there's, there's that kind of engagement in the 
linguistic specificity um, that can be talked about um, in any language, right? Uh, I, I think that's something where that limit of horizons um, that is uh, really prevalent in hermeneutics and phenomenology uh, needs to be questioned. Um, there's, there's a certain limit of horizons, sure, but, but haven't we always been moving that coin? Haven't we been pushing it and playing with it? <laughs> right? So why, why stop at a certain point, right? Um, so I, I think that's, that's also productive. I think it's, you know, um, and, and that there should be a challenge there, right? I think uh, there should be a strong challenge and a conversation going on, right? Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of I think, where I think. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not seeing too many other questions. I know we have uh, 30 more minutes allotted in case. So if anybody else uh, does have latent questions, please feel free. Okay, I'm not seeing too much else. Um, Courtney, Craig, did you uh, have any closing remarks? Courtney, thoughts? I think that was an amazing talk. Thank you so much. Um, absolutely fascinating. And what a what an amazing way to kind of finish off this week, I think. <laughs> it's all some food for thought. This lead okay. to some food for dinner too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, and I will echo that to Harjeet. That was uh, very well done. Thank you. I was writing down all the words I didn't know and I filled two pages. So uh highly educational. <laughs> we can have a coffee too, Craig, you and I. <laughs> okay, yeah your open door policy. Uh, I wish we could, uh, you know, show more expressively our appreciation, but I, I'm sure that uh, everyone stuck around long enough. That's testimony to how, how well you did. So thank you, but give everyone a chance yeah. to show as they had, as they want, would like. Here's uh, the icons of applause. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> virtual applause. <laughs> And Courtney, will you will you close uh, as our administrator? Or? I will. Yes, of course. So I wish everyone an amazing weekend. Be healthy. Be safe. Take care of yourselves. And hopefully, we'll see you all again, be it Zoom or in person, sometime soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks.